very lucky to have with us one of the country's top journalists uh, who is uh, who has been covering this intersection of security and law, uh, and uh, breaking stories and and providing insight. And among among other things, um, Bart Gilman, who you know is a fellow here, and I just like to yeah, yeah, yeah. want to say hello and apologize for being here. Um, Dan Clyde is uh, is the author of. Killer Capture, which we have some extra copy of. Um, he is one of the top legal journalists in the country. Uh, I first met him more than almost two decades ago, probably, in Washington, D.C. He was a top writer for Legal Times, uh, which is uh, a really uh, high quality legal publication in, in, in the nation's capital. That, um, um, among other alumni include Dan, uh, Joe Abramson, the executive editor of the New York Times, and Jim Lyons, who's here too. Um, who's all mine? Yeah. Who's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also here? <laughs> 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 um, and uh, Dan, what does that say that all the people who know me work here? <laughs> 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 Bad history. It had this lunch. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, the uh, Dan was at Newsweek, uh, among other things, as managing editor. He is now a senior correspondent uh, and took uh, took a considerable amount of time to write this really important book, which I think is is uh, reminds me of another book that uh, both defined people's understanding of the Justice Department, but also has stood the test of time, Victor Navasky's book on um, Robert Kennedy's Justice Department. I think this, this ranks with that in, in its, in its uh, insights. And uh, Dan has written a number of recent articles about the continuing legal framework of the Cold War. Uh, he also has written a, um, an exploration of the uh, the mind and uh, and moods of General Petraeus with Gail Sheehy, which will also, I hope you know. <laughs> um, Definitely the most interesting cobalt line I've ever had. That's, we, we, we're going to have to guess which paragraph each of you wrote. Um, but anyway, we're very lucky to have him. Um, and we thought it would be great, if you don't mind, if you would just start by talking a little bit about what you see as the top issues going forward and, and, the, and the way they affect uh, what you wrote about. Now, I've got a bunch of questions, and I know that other folks do, too. And people, uh, when you ask your questions, you could identify who you are and what, what you work on. And again, please do join us down front, because there are no microphones. See how they're listening. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Boy, you, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> and Dan is also a resident, as many of us are, of, of uh, the neighborhood that made silver, so the best neighborhood in New York. And most Go ahead, Dan Clark. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I love the Brennan Center. Um, uh, the work that you guys do um, is hugely valuable to me, as I was... Uh, uh, researching and writing the book, um, uh, the, uh, the, I, I even had some serendipitous um, encounters with people here um, who became characters in my book, John Brennan, mm -hmm. uh, who spoke, I guess not in this building, um, but uh, at the Atlantic Foundation, um, <coughs> and, uh, actually uh, kind of a key moment uh, in, in his uh, tenure. Uh, Obama administration, um, uh, we began speaking kind of more transparently about some of the policies, uh, pushing more aggressively uh, for for, uh, for certain policies that uh, the administration was not really talking about all that much. Um, let me just say one quick special word about Michael. Um, as you pointed out, we're neighbors um, in uh, the uh, what a friend of mine calls the PP. Uh, P PRPS, the People's Republic of Park Slope. Uh, I, I sometimes take uh, take runs uh, with my dog in Prospect Park um, relatively early in the morning, and 
and um, I'm always delighted um, when I run into to Michael with his dog. Notice not running. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of the reason I'm delighted to see him, because it gives me an excuse to stop running. Uh, but, uh, but when you're writing a book, as Michael knows uh, better than I do, you become sometimes obsessive about your subject, um, and, uh, uh, and when you, when you find a captive audience, um, you know, all you want to do is, is, is talk about it. Michael was great uh, having worked in the White House, um, understanding these issues, his legal background, his uh, historical perspective. So I owe a, a debt of uh, gratitude to Michael for helping me uh, sharpen some of my ideas uh, uh, for the book. So, so thank you very much. Um, well, let me, let me just start uh, very briefly by talking about uh, some of the, uh, the themes in, in my book, and I want to quickly move on to uh, where, as you put it, where, where Obama is going to go from here in terms of counterterrorism uh, policy, um, given the fact that he won a second term. He ought to be uh, somewhat more unencumbered, um, and, uh, and, and, and I think there will be changes. It will be interesting to see um, where the real action will be, and we'll get into that. Um, but just very briefly, uh, what I set to do uh, with uh, Killer Capture um, was to chronicle um, a president um, who uh, campaigned on reforming uh, a, a war on terrorism, um, uh, which he had, um, and a lot of the country had a lot of problems with, and to roll back the excesses of the <coughs> uh, administration. And um, you all follow these issues closely. You're a sophisticated audience. You obviously know that it didn't turn out quite the way uh, that he had wanted it to. Um, and uh, the reasons for that are many and, uh, and complicated. Um, and and um, uh, But let me lay out just a, a, a few of them. Um, first of all, he obviously <coughs> inherited uh, uh, an economy that was in, in, in great crisis um, and was far worse uh, than, uh, than any of them had been still teetering on the brink of, of even a possible depression if they didn't find a way to break the trend. This isn't, a, this isn't to excuse him, uh, but it's to, to try to understand the mindset a little bit um, when, uh, when they took over uh, the, the government. Um, um, o Obama, uh, I think, um, I thought a lot about this. Um, I think he genuinely did want to do the things that he set out to do. Uh, I think he really did believe uh, that closing the economy was important. Uh, I think he really did believe that uh, uh, doing civilian trials um, uh, for the 9/11 uh, defendants um, uh, was was uh, was the right thing to do. Was a way of showing uh, resilience. Uh, and and frankly, he thought that uh, those. Civilian trials, for a lot of reasons, would be more effective than military commissions. Uh, in the end, um, on a lot of these issues, um, he, he lost his nerve. Um, he flinched. Um, that sounds harsh, um, and um, and I I I'm. Uh, I like to think of myself as a uh, um, an empathetic reporter, kind of trying to find that line between. Um, you know, empathy uh, and detachment, um, but uh, uh, but I think he did, and, and I think the reasons are are in some way understandable. Uh, first, you have to consider what he was going through. You have to consider the sort of hot house uh, atmosphere of, of any White House, um, and Michael knows this well. Uh, but particularly a White House that was in some ways run by Ronald Reagan. Um, who I think uh, what was the famous quote? You know, you never waste, uh, you never never waste a good crisis. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, Ron thrived on uh, crisis, um, and he was very effective at framing presidential choices um, uh, in a kind of uh, very stark and kind of zero sum game way. Um, and I'll give you one. One example of that, um, just to give you a sense of um, uh, what it was like inside that White House when uh, Obama had to practice what the White House called triage, um, basically prioritizing uh, between uh, all the various um, things that they were trying to get done. And, and so much of it in that first year was about saving the economy, it was about getting a stimulus package through, it was about 
uh, uh, rescuing the banks, um, uh, bailing out uh, Detroit. Um, <clears throat> these uh, counterterrorism issues uh, would pop up, um, and um, they were always uh, uh, very difficult uh, legally, uh, substantively, politically. Um, uh, Guantanamo detainees <coughs> did not have, uh, uh, you know, uh, these issues didn't really have a, a constituency other than people like yourselves. Um, um, Obama um, didn't really have, I don't think he really had the ability to rally the American people around these issues because frankly if you look at the polling pretty consistently, um, you know, Guantan closing Guantanamo was not a high priority <coughs> for the American people. So just getting back to, to Rom's ability to frame choices in this kind of context, um, in, the, in the spring of, of 2009, there was an appropriations bill working its way through, through Congress. Um, and um, there was a, uh, one provision, uh, was $1.1 trillion uh, for, um, uh, for the IMF, uh, for loans uh, uh, for the IMF. Um, and this had come out of a G20 meeting that uh, Obama had been to in London. This was about rescuing the, the global economy. Another provision was uh, restrictions to uh, bringing detainees into the United States. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in just a second um, uh, in a little bit more depth when we uh, move on to today. Um, the way Rahm Emanuel framed, framed, he framed it as a choice. He said, Mr. President, you can either have your uh, uh, trillion dollars to, to save the, the global, global economy, <coughs> or you can have, or you can save the Uyghurs, the, the Chinese dissidents who we were going to bring into the country. Um, and, uh, um, and, and that's just one example. That's the way it was, that, that, that's the way that the choices were framed over and over and over again. Um, and, um, you know, what ended up happening, um, you know, is, is that Obama um, never really engaged Congress on these issues. Um, he realized he had talked during the campaign about breaking the, the, the fever of fear um, and uh, you know the politics of fear. We have to move beyond the <coughs> politics of, of fear, um, and um, he he didn't really do it. Um, he 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 saw. Uh, in some of those early votes, for example, on detainee issues, on Guantanamo, uh, votes going against the White House, I think one of them was 90 to 6. The vast majority of his own party uh, was against him on, on these issues. Um, and so he backed down pretty quickly. Um, you know, at one point he gave, you all recall, uh, I think one of the best speeches he ever gave, just in terms of pure speech, taking very complicated issues and making them clear and compelling, the archive speech. Um, and they call, the White House, they call those framing speeches. Um, and uh, it had zero impact, none at all. Um, now, Obama's Achilles heels in some way, and he, he <coughs> If you watched how he dealt with these issues inside the White House, it was enormously impressive. He led constitutional seminars with his advisors. Uh, he personally helped craft uh, a lot of the legal briefs that basically became the kind of uh, the, the legal architecture for his war on terror. Very engaged. Uh, but when it came to, uh, to, to, uh, to actually uh, you know, engaging Congress, um, you know, he didn't have the, 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 he didn't seem to have the temperament, he didn't have the, the jawboning and, and arm twisting uh, skills uh, that, uh, uh, that I guess you would need to have uh, to work a sort of inside game. Um, and, um, and I think he, um, uh, as much as he struggled with these issues, ultimately um, he was persuaded by Rom and by people on the political team uh, that uh, uh, that he didn't have the political capital <coughs> to do all of the things he wanted to do. These were issues that fell by the wayside uh, because they didn't have constituencies. And at the end of the day, he was not going to, as much as the criticism from the left uh, and from civil libertarians, I think genuinely stung him, um, uh, at the end of the day, he decided uh, that uh, 
um, you know, that that's just not where he was going to put his, uh, his political capital. Um, and, you know, I don't subscribe to the, 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 uh, the idea that, that Obama uh, simply perpetuated uh, George Bush's war on terror. That was a meme that became very popular. Uh, Jack Goldsmith, I think, was the first one to write about it in, in the New Republic. Um, there's no question that, that uh, uh, you know, <coughs> Guantanamo is still open. Um, there are other complications, of course, with Guantanamo um, that, 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 uh, that would, would have been hard to get around anyway. I can't remember the number. It was roughly 100 Yemenis um, who uh, um, had not been charged, but many of whom uh, had associations with, with al-Qaeda or or the affiliate organization in Yemen, or what was to become a QAP. Uh, Yemen obviously was in a state of chaos. The central government had no way of, of, of ensuring that these people would be uh, incarcerated and held. And so there was, I think, legitimate fear about sending those people back to Yemen. Um, and uh, it, it, there were other issues. Well, let me just give you one, uh, uh, one key turning point in this story. Um, which I think is a kind of a microcosm uh, of how the president dealt with uh, these issues in his first uh, year or two. And that is, go back to the Uyghurs, that is the story of these Chinese dissidents um, who uh, ended up at Guantanamo, uh, even though they had no connection to Al-Qaeda, were not in any real sense a threat to the United <coughs> States. You all probably know the story a little bit, the Uyghurs, uh, or Chinese dissidents, a Turkic-speaking people in the far reaches of Central Asia, um, whose beef was not with America, it was with China. Um, by the way, my, my editor was um, somewhat concerned when I turned in my first, first chapter of my book, which was about the Uyghurs, and it was 10,000 words. <laughs> uh, but, but he rightfully cut it back uh, considerably, and then understood uh, why the story uh, was was important um, and uh, and a key kind of turning point in Obama's story on, on these issues. Um, when the administration came in, even during the transition, uh, people who were beginning to really sort of look at who was in Guantanamo and, and, and look at how are we actually going to close down, uh, it was a lot more complicated than we had anticipated. Um, they realized that the only way to do it was to persuade our allies um, to take uh, some of the prisoners themselves, a lot of them. Uh, well, how are we going to persuade the Germans and the French and the Brits and the Australians and whoever else to take uh, detainees? Um, we would have to step up to the plate ourselves. And so they looked at the population and they looked at um, uh, you know, which detainees we would be able to take. Um, politics would, would tolerate, and they quickly identified the Uyghurs um, because they were uh, represented really no threat uh, to the United States in terms of security or minimal threat. Um, there was a Uyghur population um, community in Northern Virginia, um, and so a plan was hatched to bring a very small number of these Uyghurs uh, to, uh, uh, to Northern Virginia just outside of Washington. I think it was in Falls Church. Um, and uh, it was uh, planned as a kind of a secret operation because people in the White House understood that if it leaked, um, there could be a problem. And uh, sure enough, they were right. Uh, the plan did leak. Um, a backbench member of Congress uh, from Virginia, uh, whose district, I don't even think the Uyghurs were going to be in his district, but they were going to be near his district, Frank Wolf. Uh, immediately sends a letter to the president saying this is an outrage. He gives a speech on, on the House floor, um, and he says, do you realize, speaking to his fellow members of Congress, that these terrorists are coming to your neighborhood? And this was the, the NIMBY uh, explosion that just uh, swept across Congress, Republicans and Democrats alike. And uh, as soon as that happened, I mean, not a day went by uh, after that rebellion in Congress that Obama caved. He said, we're not doing this. He was furious. He felt he'd been sandbagged. He felt, why am I going to, why am I going to, uh, you know, potentially sacrifice my domestic agenda on a small group of Chinese dissidents? And look, from a 
purely political perspective, you know, you can sort of understand that. Um, the, the question was, and, and what I ultimately concluded, you can't really conclude it conclusively because you can't prove a negative, but um, he, he, I think, uh, uh, wrongly uh, made the judgment that he couldn't sort of walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, and, and, you know, he was asking the American people uh, to be resilient um, uh, in, in, in the face of, of, of the threat and to push back on the politics of fear. And yet his actions uh, in this first year um, did not um, demonstrate the kind of resilience that he was asking the American people to do. The same thing was true with uh, KSM, which we can talk about maybe when we get to questions. Um, the same thing was true with most of these issues. It was true with uh, indefinite detention, where Obama, uh, for you know the f most of the first year, all of the first year, and, mo and some of the second year, uh, couldn't make a decision. He was his advisors were telling him that he had to accept a regime of, 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 of indefinite detention, at least for those uh, uh, detainees who were still in Guantanamo. Who who they, judged, who they said could not be released or could not be tried. And he wouldn't do it. Um, and he stalled and vacillated and, and he played for time and ultimately he caved there as well. Um, he didn't want to do it, but he did. Um, and, uh, and this was a pattern that was sort of repeated throughout those first uh, couple of years. Then you obviously had uh, the uh, underwear bombing att attempt on Christmas Day. And at that point, uh, by then Congress was passing laws restricting any detainees from coming into the country, restricting civilian trials. And at that point, th there was really not a whole lot that Obama could do on these issues. Let me just make one very quick point on drones, um, and, then, um, and then we can uh, go to questions and talk about um, the, the here and now. Um, when people talk about Obama's policies being essentially you know, more continuity than change when it comes to, to uh, uh, when it, when it comes to uh, counterterrorism, um, they often talk about the drone uh, policy, um, and that, and that, and I think there's truth to that. Um, but that is not, uh, I think, uh, an example of where he can be uh, accused of selling out um, his principles or acting as a hypocrite. And the reason I say that is because I believe that Obama, from the time. Uh, even from the time he was, he was beginning his campaign, I think there's evidence to show uh, that he actually saw value in the drone program. Um, he was uh, highly critical of, of the Bush-Cheney policies you know, on Guantanamo, on indefinite detention. He was kind of uh, <coughs> uh, not completely clear about military commissions, but, it, but he also criticized at least military commissions as done by the Bush administration. And one thing you never heard him say publicly was you, you never heard him criticize the drone program. Um, and to the contrary, uh, he gave one major counterterrorism <coughs> speech um, during the campaign, and that was in August 2007 at the Wilson Center. Um, and uh, that speech is, is well known for uh, one particular um, uh, uh, thing that he said, which was that, that uh, uh, he was talking about Pakistan, he was saying if, if Musharraf is not willing, if there's a high value target in Pakistan, and Musharraf is not willing to go after uh, 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 that target, um, then we will unilaterally. That got quoted a lot after the Bin Laden operation. Um, he was criticized at the time by McCain and by Hillary Clinton as being naive. Um, uh, and and, and uh, came up in the debates. He said another thing in that speech that has not gotten quoted very much, and uh, see if I can remember it. He he said um, he said uh, uh, if I'm elected, I will ensure uh, that the military uh, does uh, everything it can. Uh, uh, I will ensure that the military is more uh, agile, stealthy, and lethal in its ability to kill or capture, although I think he said capture or kill, uh, 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 suspected uh, uh, ter terrorists. Um, and when I, went, when I was doing the book and I went back and I looked at that, I 
like, oh, that's, that's interesting. I wonder specifically what he's talking about. But I talked to his aides, and in fact, uh, uh, some of the people who helped craft that speech, uh, they told me he had the drone program in, in his mind when he wrote about that. Last point on that, which is that, that I think the reason uh, he was already thinking about drones was he saw that as a capability that was very much uh, very much in line with his basic, basic <coughs> approach uh, to fighting uh, this war on Al Qaeda. He, he was running uh, in part uh, to uh, wind down the wars of 9 11, to end the war in Iraq, to win decisively in Afghanistan, but then pull the troops out. Um, and yet he understood that there were still threats around the world that he had to deal with. Um, drones would give him a kind of uh, uh, I think, in his mind, what he was being told, a very targeted, surgical approach uh, to dealing with these threats uh, without sending armies of occupation uh, to countries. Um, and and, and he, has, he has been absolutely consistent about that all the way through, um, uh, although, and this is something I think we can talk about because it's relevant in, for the, some of the things that are going on now, um, there have been, I think, many more debates within the administration about uh, the kinds of strikes they've been doing, signature strikes versus personality strikes, uh, and, uh, and, and to what extent uh, the program, um, the CIA, should, uh, uh, should, should, uh, should be allowed to operate uh, without, uh, without restraints, uh, the military as well. So um, uh, let's, uh, happy to answer your questions and then, and then talk about either any of the things that that have happened in the past four years or what we think might happen in the next four years? Let me start with a backward-looking question. Yeah. Um, what do you think uh, historians uh, decades from now will be in a position to learn that you were not able to learn? Um, <laughs> a lot, <laughs> to start. Um, you know, I, I think that, that the one thing, um, you know, I think I did a, a reasonably good job of, of, of getting inside um, the, the debates uh, within the administration and also the debates, you know, inside Obama's own mind. Um, I mean, you had these warring impulses. I, I would think of Obama in a lot of ways as, you know, a very complicated character, um, a guy who, um, who sort of um, lives in a world of contradictions and embraces those contradictions, gravitates toward nuance and, and, and complexity. Um, and that sometimes led to, uh, to vacillation and stalling. Um, and he was not, uh, he, you know, he has this image now of being extremely decisive on the kind of military side, uh, doing the Bin Laden operation and many of these other kinds of operations. But in terms of these issues that we're interested in, in terms of the balance between you know, law and liberty and security, uh, he was not terribly decisive. He was caught between his impulses. I was really struck the degree to which um, uh, he would play for time and stall and, and play, off, play his uh, advisors off of each other. If you look at the KSM uh, case, for example, um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I believe that he believed that trying KSM in New York City uh, was the right thing to do. Uh, most people don't realize this, but he had a conversation with the Attorney General um, on July 4th uh, of 2009, so you know, six months into his presidency. Um, it, was, uh, it was on the on the rooftop of the White House, and the Attorney General said uh, to Obama, uh, I, um, I think I'm leaning toward trying KSM in a civilian court. Um, and the President said, well, you're the Attorney General, that's your choice, basically gave him a, a green light. Um, at the same time, sometime later, you know, he was authorizing uh, his uh, chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, uh, to work, to conspire, essentially, with Lindsey Graham, uh, you know, a, a prominent senator, senator from the opposing party, um, to thwart his own attorney general's, uh, uh, you know, initiative on, on, on KSM. And so, um, I was able to sort of see a lot of those conflicts and see him, but I, I, I never felt uh, that I really was able to, to sort of penetrate his the sort of innermost thoughts on, 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 on those kinds of um, dilemmas that he was facing. And I would hope 
um, you know, uh, that, that historians will be able will, will be able to, um, you know, the, that's I think the kind of the holy grail for historians. So I should mention <clears throat> I should mention that at least one of our colleagues is, is listening in on the phone, uh, Liza Goitin, the co-director of our Liberty and National Security Program with Liza Patel, who's here. I know the folks have questions. Um, why don't we throw it open and I, I have a few more, but I want to see what, uh, what, what's on people's minds. Michael, since you, since you mentioned me, can I, can I break in with a, with a question? This is Liza Goitin in Washington, D.C. Absolutely. Um, Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for being here. It's so interesting to, to listen to. I actually have two questions, but I guess I'll just ask one now and then give other people a chance and then see if I have time to ask the other one later. Um, the first one is that you, uh, you sort of portray President Obama, at least on some of the detainee issues, as sort of having his heart in the right place but losing his nerve. And I guess I don't disagree with that, but I think if you look at counterterrorism policy more generally, there are some other data points that I think some people might say kind of indicate that, that or at least call into question whether, whether he really intended to backtrack from all the Bush policies. And, and that includes some of the information gathering, intelligence gathering, um, and privacy issues yeah. um, in terms of surveillance and, and intelligence gathering by law enforcement agencies, where really um, the FBI, and again, there's, there's, we don't know at this point in history where Obama is on these issues, but the FBI has really been more rigorous than it was under the Bush administration in terms of its expanding its own authorities in, the, in those areas. Um, and then if you look at uh, secrecy, um, I think government secrecy, which was certainly a hallmark of the Bush administration, this is a case where, you know, the Obama administration has, you know, while it's been very transparent in other areas, in the national security area, it's really um, embraced quite um, proactively some of the tools of secrecy and has even, you know, has gone after national security whistleblowers in a way that the Bush administration really never did. And reporters. Um, so and, reporters. Reporters. Yeah, and reporters. And reporters, yeah. that's right. And so, and I, and I think on that, we have some evidence on that issue that President Obama actually, uh, you know, that his, his own personal inclinations, um, that he really supported that personally going after some of the national security. I think that's right. I, I, I think, you know, this is actually not an area that I ended up getting into uh, a whole lot in my, in my book. Uh, you, you, you may remember um, very early on in his presidency, I think it's um, in March, maybe February of, of 2000, I think it was February of 2009, um, and the president picks up the New York Times uh, one morning and he sees uh, that one of the, uh, 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 the lawyers for the Justice Department, an appellate lawyer for the Justice Department, had gone into a uh, federal appeals court in San Francisco, I think, um, and, um, and, and, and basically maintained the same position that the Bush administration had maintained on, st on state secrets. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the judge, act, you know, one of the judges on the panel actually says, uh, am I missing something here? I mean, do you want to add, you know, do, Give, give, giving him an opportunity to, to change uh, uh, course, uh, and he says, "Is that no. your final answer?" <laughs> is, is that your final answer, right? And he says, "No, this has been thoroughly vetted within the administration." Now, Obama picks up the New York Times, and he didn't know apparently uh, that this was going on. He had not been briefed, which is kind of one of the first uh, <coughs> bad episodes with uh, Greg Craig. Um, uh, but he's furious. Um, and you'd think he was furious uh, because he had real substantive problems with maintaining the same position uh, that the Bush administration had. At least that's what I thought at first. As I reported it, I realized he was actually furious because uh, he felt he was, he was um, sort of sandbagged. And um, I think it was the first time that Anthony Romero was quoted um, in the New York Times, uh, uh, you know, saying it was more of the same, and comparing him to... Uh, to George to George Bush, which Obama hated, but then he set up a um, you know kind of a task force to take a look at uh, state secrets, um, and he there were some adjustments, but he basically mm -hmm. stayed where the Bush administration was, um, and the little bit of reporting I did on this uh, I think confirms exactly what you're saying, which is that um, I don't know if you want to frame it as his heart was not in the right place, but certainly. Um, uh, he's, he's more hardline on these issues, and he was hardline 
uh, very hard line on leaks, um, and as I guess a lot of the people here probably know, um, more uh, reporters um, have been subpoenaed in these national security uh, investigations during the, during the Obama administration than in all of the previous administrations put together. Um, and, you know, I think, um, look, part of it is, uh, you know, I imagine that when you do become president and you begin to see the intelligence and you see what a scary world it is and you assume the responsibilities for protecting the, the country, you start looking at these issues a little bit differently. But I was personally surprised uh, that, uh, that on, on, on privacy issues and on transparency, um, he was more hawkish. Uh, than he would have appeared to have been based on what he was saying during the uh, during the campaign. But does, does that it at all inform sort of your thoughts or understanding about where he has on detainee issues, or do you think those are just separable separable things? Um, that's a good question, and it's one, frankly, because that I did nobody, not, yeah. yeah. Nobody knows where his heart is on, on any of these things. Yeah. I feel like it, it's partly sort of collecting a, a mosaic, not just you yeah. said <laughs> yeah. of um, yeah. pieces of data on. And, and so anyway, I was just curious what your what your gut was on that because I you know I feel like I'm at a loss to figure out sometimes. But anyway. Yeah. No, I think it's an excellent question, and instead of just um, you know. I'd rather think about it um, and, and do a little bit of reporting, so I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes. Um, when I was in law school, there was a member of the uh, Obama administration, I think it was an assistant defense secretary talking to the law students, and I think this was fall of 2010, and at the time, he made sort of the argument that the Obama, the Obama administration was going to justify uh, the indefinite detention in Guantanamo on the basis of treating them as though they were prisoners of war right. under the mm -hmm. Geneva Conventions. And I sort of being the snarky law student that I was asked whether that also meant they were going to apply all the other Geneva Conventions, including the sort of um, uh, you know, immunity from criminal prosecution for combatants. Um, <coughs> And the you know the defense secretary said, well you know we have to divide the you know not all the provisions we're not going to apply all the provisions. I guess I was just wondering, um, you spoke a lot about Obama's involvement in the legal architecture briefs. I was wondering if there was any sort of serious consideration for applying this paradigm, this sort of set of laws to the war on terror wholesale. If that was ever seriously considered by the administration in, in your research. Yeah, I mean that's it. That's you know, if you go back and you look at the, the, the uh, I think it was the March 14th or the March 11th brief, this was 2009 when, uh, when the district court judge in Washington um, was, uh, there was all this uh, Guantanamo related and habeas related uh, litigation um, and the administration uh, had to, um, uh, you know, these deadlines that were looming, the administration um, had to answer questions about whether they were going to change their basic arguments um, about um, who could be detained, um, about where the battle, to, uh, you know, how, how far the battlefield ex extended, um, all these kind of basic questions. So this brief, for, I think it was Judge Bates, became, becomes the kind of founda foundational legal document for Obama's war on terror. And very early on, um, I think it's uh, late February, early March of 2009, Obama summons Greg Craig uh, and uh, lawyers from uh, the Justice Department and, and other lawyers in the White House Counsel's Office to go through, uh, you know, uh, all of these issues and decide what their position is, is going to be. And this is the moment uh, when, from a legal point of view, they could have really differentiated themselves in you know, fundamental ways from the Bush administration, um, at least in terms of um, you know, where the, what they thought their authorities were. Um, and, and, um, and, and if you look at it, and this was Jack Goldsmith's main argument, he went to that document and realized that a whole host of issues they basically maintained the Bush policy. So on, uh, they justified Guantanamo and, and indefinite detention. They accepted that, they accepted as a matter of law that they could hold detainees indefinitely under the laws of war internationally, the international law, but also under the uh, domestic law and the, the authorization of the use of military force. Um, you know, uh, they, 
they they changed the the standards a, l a little bit. Um, I think they had they substantial support. substantial support mm -hmm. as opposed to just support. There are a lot of people who don't think that that's a, a meaningful um, distinction. Um, but they accepted the war <coughs> paradigm um, from that early mm -hmm. earliest moment. Um, and it's uh, although you know targeted killings uh, are not mentioned in that <coughs> in that March brief. Everyone, and I interviewed all, most of the people who worked on that brief, everyone understood uh, that, uh, uh, that, that the arguments they were making in the context of detention, which was a law of war argument, was going to apply uh, to targeted killings as well. Because they were already, you know, they had already done targeted <coughs> killings. In fact, the first targeted killing of Obama's presidency is January 23rd, uh, three days after he takes office, hours after he's signed the executive orders rolling back you know, the excesses of the, of the Bush-Cheney administration. And of course, as some of you may know, that very first drone strike went very badly awry and killed an innocent Pakistani uh, tribal elder and much of his family. Um, so that's a little bit of a, uh, a, a tangent. Um, but, um, uh, uh, but they're thinking through these issues in those first, literally those first weeks, and essentially embracing the legal arguments that, uh, that, the, that the Bush administration um, had, had maintained. There's some distinct distinctions that are not unimportant, and one of them is, um, you know, uh, Obama basically uh, strongly, in that brief, strongly uh, said or implied that they would not rely on uh, his, uh, primarily on his Article II powers as Commander-in-Chief mm -hmm. to justify uh, a lot of these counterterrorism <laughs> policies. Um, but in the main, uh, they they uh, accepted and continuing and continued the arguments of the Obama, of the Bush administration and and, and the war par paradigm was a was was a, you know the main one in some ways. Uh, at the end of a second term for President Obama, it will it will be 16 or 15 years after 9/11, and you know in the past when there has been a threat to the country and often an overreaction, or what is seen as an overreaction, uh, it's somewhat temporary and it subsides. Either it's undone, or the emergency passes, or, or the court rulings, or whatever. We saw that after World War II, we saw that uh, after the Vietnam War. Um, we're in this semi-permanent state of, of conflict now. Uh, do you envision things subsiding uh, just as a matter of course and time, or do you see these institutions uh, living on even when the threat is not as, as immediate. In other words, I, I think that's the, look forward I know, four years? I think that's the, in, in some ways, the most important question, uh, kind of overarching <laughs> question going, going forward. And I remember asking, you know, you've probably heard people say that, you know, well, the war on terrorism, you know, it, you, you'll never know uh, when the war ends because there won't be a signing ceremony, you know, on some battleship in, in, in the ocean somewhere. Um, and so I was, uh, I was on a, a panel discussion, and so, someone said, uh, asked the question, when will we know the war on terrorism is over? Um, and, um, and the person said, uh, and I thought this was a, a really interesting um, uh, answer to the question. He said, well, we'll know that the war on terrorism is over when our, our politics are resilient enough um, to go back to uh, to, to end the state of emergency, essentially, and go back to more uh, traditional modes of fighting terrorism, when we can tolerate, uh, you know, approach that, you know, it's always going to be a hybrid approach uh, to some extent, and there'll be a military and, a, and an intelligence um, role to play, but will we be able to go back to um, more uh, traditional law enforcement um, uh, tactics as well? Um, uh, and, and I think you're beginning to see um, and, and this is a good segue to uh, some of the evolving policies that I think we might see in the, in the next term. You're beginning to see acknowledgement within um, this administration and this White House uh, that that process has to begin, that we are no longer, in fact, I talked to a very senior White House official um, uh, in, in when I was doing a piece on who, who would be the next CIA director, who actually talked about winding down the state of emergency. Those were his, his words. Um, and it is coming up, interestingly, in the context of the drone program. 
And you may have seen there was a report in the New York Times. I wrote, I wrote over the weekend. I wrote a story about this as well. Um, that uh, John Brennan, who, as everyone knows, has been the president's chief counterterrorism advisor and, in a lot of ways, the public face of the drone program, and, and, and um, presided over it as uh, as, as this administration really kind of ramped it up. Um, he is. Uh, doing a couple of things internally that I think really bear watching and, and, and are very interesting. Um, one is um, he's trying to put together a, a what they're calling the playbook, uh, kind of the rules of the road for, uh, for the drone program so that they are kind of regularized protocols um, and, and kind of a, a more clearer uh, uh, legal framework uh, under which the drone program would, would, would operate. Um, that is partly uh, for uh, Obama's successors. Um, and one of the interesting things about Obama um, I, I thought was really sort of revealing is, you know, most presidents, when they come in, they want to leave the presidency with as much power, if not more power, um, uh, than, uh, than they had when they, when they came in. Um, and that's uh, especially true in the area of national security. Obama has kind of turned it around in an interesting way. He's actually been more maximalist in terms of presidential power on, on, on the domestic side. The DREAM Act, lots of things that he's done by executive order um, and things that he's done unilaterally. He's always been sensitive uh, about, uh, about not um, uh, enhancing uh, presidential power in the area of national security. One brief example is um, uh, in July of 2009, um, when his advisors thought that he was going to enshrine a, a new policy of indefinite detention, <clears throat> go to Congress, you know. Um, he, uh, in, in a meeting um, with Harold Coe, the State Department's legal advisor, he, he said, you know, I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure I want to do this. I'm not sure I want to leave mm -hmm. uh, my successor with a loaded weapon. Which was interesting, he was alluding to uh, the uh, Justice Jackson's dissent in the Korematsu case and the uh, Japanese internment case, it was about precedent. It was about uh, leaving too much power behind. Um, and um, and this, was, this is the same thing that's going on with this playbook. Uh, worried. It, it's not that Obama, Obama has sort of supreme confidence in his own ability to handle power responsibly, but he was worried about, and in that meeting, by the way, he said, I don't know if Mitt Romney, this is July 2009, I don't know if Mitt Romney is going to succeed me four years from now. He was already thinking uh, that, that he knew he was, that Romney was likely to be his challenger, and he thought there was a reasonable chance that he would win, which there was. Um, and, and so this is what's going on with Brennan developing this, this playbook for Obama's successors. So there is a kind of a uh, you know, kind of a, a set of protocols that future pre that you would institutionalize the rules uh, that that uh, that, uh, that that govern uh, the use of, of, of drones. That's one thing that Brennan's doing. But the other thing that, in some ways, is is as interesting, if not more interesting, is uh, there are indications that he is trying to wean the CIA off of its reliance on on drones and return the agency back to its traditional role as an intelligence gatherer. Uh, and, and analyzer of, of intelligence, and shift the program away from the CIA to the military. As most of you, I'm sure, know, the military also has a targeted killing program. Um, they also use drones. The difference is uh, that uh, the, the military operates uh, more openly. There, there are kind of uh, regularized protocols that are subject to international law. The CIA won't even admit since they don't admit that they even have a program, they certainly don't admit that they are uh, bound by international law. Um, and so I think that is going to be a very interesting thing to watch. Um, I think that the CIA, uh, which has been turned uh, because of the emergency, has in some ways used the crisis to turn itself into a paramilitary organization, um, is uh, going to guard uh, these uh, these powers and these weapons very, very jealously. Uh, uh, Petraeus um, was a big fan of the drone program. He was um, uh, uh, enhancing its fleet of, of, of predators and, and reaper drones. Um, and so now you have an opportunity uh, with a new CIA director coming in. And by the way, really good chance that it's going to be John Brennan. 
Um, and uh, I, I don't know this, but I suspect that um, the other likely contender to head the CIA, um, Morrell, who's now the acting and has been the deputy attorney general, uh, deputy CIA director, um, is more of an institutionalist um, and, and may want to protect uh, the, the CIA's drone. The, the third candidate is is Mike Vickers, um, who's the uh, who, who uh, oversees military intelligence and has a background both as a CIA analyst and also in the um, uh, sort of special ops world. Um, is is one of the most kind of aggressive advocate, advocates of of, uh, of of turning the CIA into a paramilitary organization. So depending on who ends up getting this job, we'll, we'll have a lot to say about what happens to the drone program. So I have two questions. Um, so one relates to precedence in the drone program. I mean, is there any thought within the administration about what the precedent that they set with the use of drones means for other countries around the world? I mean, I understand that you know, the technology is not perhaps developed in the rest of the world yet, but that will happen. And I just wonder whether they're thinking about what happens when you know somebody else starts to use these drones. Yeah, this is one of these issues that I think would, would come up, and people would recognize uh, that there's an issue. The president uh, would sometimes say in meetings, you know, I'm worried about blowback. Uh, I think that was his, his word. Um, you know, Harold Coe would talk about this. They talk sometimes about. Um, I think the term they use is reciprocity. Mm -hmm. uh, one example uh, that uh, would, would occasionally come up uh, was, well, if we're doing this and we're going after the people who we deem to be terrorists, what about the Chinese? Or the Russians. Or the Russians. And are the, and, and, and the, the, you know, as hard as this is to, to, to fathom, the, 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 the uh, example that came up occasionally in meetings was, well, what if the, what if the Chinese decide, you know, they want to go after uh, you know, in fighting their global war on terrorism, they want to go after the Uyghurs. Are we going to see drones, mm -hmm. you know, being fired in, in, in Fairfax, uh, uh, Virginia? That seems rather unlikely, but, but, uh, uh, but it, it, my sense was it was one of those things that would come up, there was an acknowledgement that it was an issue, and then they would just want it to go away. Mm -hmm. um, and there was very little, you know, once the, you know, the genie was out of the bottle, there was very little that, uh, uh, that 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 they could do. Now, I you know I imagine um, there, and I haven't reported this, and it's it's something that that I think we all should be looking into. Uh, that in this process, that Brennan is leading. That part of it, I I, I think they they've talked about uh, uh, getting more buy-in from Congress and from the judicial branch. What I don't know is whether they're talking about um, you know go, uh, uh, going to the UN. But, uh, well, what were you gonna, yeah. no, I mean, but looking for kind of international, allies, some sort of international architecture mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to regulate uh, the use of drones, and we're not in a very good position to do that right now, given the policy. Can I ask one more question? Sorry. Yeah. So we're talking about the next four years. I mean, one of the concerns that we have as a program is that I mean, this is the new normal, right? That you have sort of institutionalized many of the practices that were right. brought on by a quote unquote state of emergency. So, you know. How do we roll those back? And what what do you think? I and mean, where are the pressure points for groups like us to think about, you know, in pushing back against some of these policies? Well, I mean, I think I noticed today that um, I think there was a coalition of human rights organizations. I don't know if you all were part of this, but it sent a letter to the president urging him to to uh, veto the next the NDAA, uh, the NDAA the next Defense Authorization um, Act, um, and. Uh, you know, we've seen this play before, um, and at the last minute, the president uh, generally, uh, you know, caves. Um, now that he's uh, not facing re-election, um, you know, it's never easy for a president uh, to veto a defense bill, a defense uh, bill, uh, uh, but, uh, um, you know, that's really the only way, uh, I think it's the only way he's going to be able to uh, start making real progress toward uh, toward closing down Guantanamo because uh, so many of those provisions restricting uh, funding, restricting you know transfers of detainees. So I mean you know that would be one pressure point. But I mean more conceptually, yeah. like you know what what is the thing that would move them to think that well maybe we should start rolling? Like you said, you know they're thinking about yeah. how to roll back sort of the emergency measures. So even if you leave Guantanamo to the side for a moment, you know how do you what? 
what would convince them that it's time to start, you know, rolling back a bit and you know, being a little less aggressive in some of the stuff that they're doing? You know, um, when I started reporting this book, uh, there was almost no pressure on this administration when it came to drones. Um, you know, I think they felt, uh, you know, I, I, there are scenes of, of, uh, of uh, you know, Rahm Emanuel high-fiving his colleagues in the White House when they got a bad guy. Uh, Rahm was, was um, actively trying to persuade the CIA to leak um, uh, you know, their uh, successes, you know, when they killed, uh, you know, uh, high level. Uh, Second in command of Al Qaeda. The, the number the 17th of right. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Um, and I think they, they perceived that you know, there, there was only political uh, benefit for the president. Um, and now we're talking about 2009 and 2010. I think the atmosphere um, has changed radically since then. I haven't seen, if you look at polling, I haven't seen, you know, I think you still have a substantial majority of Americans um, who uh, support uh, the drone program. Um, I, I think that's diminishing a little bit. I, I've noticed some, some uh, that, that's starting to happen a little bit. Um, but it is so much part of the conversation, although it wasn't part of the, the election at all. I think drones were mentioned maybe once in one debate. Um, um, but it is, it really has kind of, um, I think, in a lot of ways captured uh, more of the public imagination. It's more controversial. Uh, I think, you know, you saw, uh, really led by Brennan, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, high-level administration officials, <coughs> Attorney General, uh, 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 Jay Johnson at the Pentagon, uh, Brennan himself, uh, CIA General Counsel, coming out and, and talking about the program a little bit more. I mean, I think that showed uh, some sensitivity. Uh, now, they were defending it for the most part, um, but, uh, but I think they also understood that they needed to be more transparency to legitimize the program. That doesn't really answer your question about institutionalizing it. I think they are looking for ways to institutionalize the program so that they can limit uh, some, of the, some of the dangers and excesses. And so, for example, there has been a healthy debate about the kinds of strikes mm -hmm. that we should be doing, this, this distinction between signature strikes and, high, and, 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 uh, and personality strikes. The signature strike being uh, when you don't actually know the identities of the people that you're going after. There are you know, a large number of military age males who bear certain signatures or uh, you know, defining characteristics associated with terrorism. Uh, that's been a very controversial policy. That's been in Guantanamo too. Yeah. Definitely for the New York City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's been a very and 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 you're beginning to see it, there's there's been a debate about that all the way through. The president um, uh, drew the line. He allowed it in Pakistan, but he drew the line. Wouldn't allow signature rights in Yemen and Somalia. And then he relented on Yemen, um, and um, you know I think that's going to be continue to be debated. Um, so.